So again, I'm Darrell Pines. I'm uh, the chair of the uh, Frontiers on Engineering Education uh, Committee, and delighted to be here and have you all here uh, on this particular 2015 symposium. And so this is the seventh annual of, that we've been doing this. Is, you know, we've had great speakers in the past and obviously great attendees, so I'm really delighted to have you all here. Uh, real quickly, I'm going to sort of walk through a few things about FOEE and then tell you who the committee again was from uh, yesterday, but I'm going to show their names again today. Talk about the vision and then sort of the attendance over the years, and then I'm going to introduce the executive director of NAE. So first of all, congratulations. Uh, you went through a thorough process, and you all should be very honored. Your university should be honored. The fact that you all have been asked to attend this workshop and symposium over the next couple of days. First of all, I also want to thank the National Academy and Executive Director Alton Romick, as well as Dan Mote, and of course Beth and, and Jason that you've already met. And of course the committee. Um, so not just me, but Nadine Aubrey, who will introduce our keynote speaker, who's a fellow dean like I am at Northeastern, Sharon Wood, another dean at University of Texas at Austin, Lisa Hotel at Duke University, Ed Berger at Purdue, Trevor Harding, unfortunately who couldn't be here, um, from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, Naomi Chesler from University of Wisconsin, and Rebecca Lynn Carrier. These are the committee that actually selected all of you. So congratulations to, again to all of you. Now I want to thank all of our speakers, and you'll see hear from them later in the next couple of days. That's all of them, with the exception of our keynote speaker. And so thank you to the um, keynote to the panel speakers, and some of them, are, of course, are former FOEE attendees. By the way, just by a show of hands, who are the FOEE attend former attendees? Thank you. Thank you for being here and, and giving back. We appreciate it. So what's the vision? Um, so the vision of the Frontiers of Engineering Education is to strengthen the engineering and innovation capacity and capability of the nation by catalyzing a vibrant community of emerging engineering education leaders like yourselves to achieve the mission of recognizing accomplishment and facilitating learning, broadening collaboration amongst all of you, and promoting dissemination of pioneering practice in engineering education. Each year, FOE brings together some of the nation's most engaged and innovative engineering educators in order to promote effective substantive and inspirational engineering education through a sustained dialogue within the engineering generation of innovative faculty like you all. And we do that by hosting this symposia annually, but also we create a community online and through your cellular interactions of engineering education scholars getting together. And then finally, there are plenty of resources on that online website that you guys all registered to come here. So hopefully you will go and, and check it out. This is what FOE has looked at uh, over the years. This is, I don't know where the artwork has come from, Jason or, or Beth, but um, uh, it's always had this network or gear sort of mechanical flavor to it. So, uh, so this is the seventh one. So the, that's the picture on the bottom there. And you see now it's a tree and you guys are all sprouting roots to grow and uh, interact with one another in your affinity group. So it uh, should be a lot of fun. Here's the attendance over the last several years. Um, this is uh, now the seventh one. Um, and as you can see, the number of attendees is increasing to a steady state number of about 70. That's that sort of middle bar in the middle. Um, these are the num number of finished applications, but there are more nominations. So there's usually over 200 nominations annually. And so again, you're part of a really elite group of people. So congratulations once again. Here's the schedule. Um, here's the day you're going to have to work. Um, so uh, <laughs> the morning's pretty straightforward. We're going to have a keynote speaker and then panel one which we'll talk about makerspaces, which we've never talked about before in this uh, series of symposia. And then we'll break for lunch, and then we'll head over and you'll do your pollsters, and we'll start breaking into our affinity groups in the after late afternoon. And this is where the fun will all start. And you'll have some questions that you'll need to answer uh, going forward. So just keep this in mind as you go over in the afternoon. Um, it'll be a very busy session um, over there today. Okay, here's an example of an affinity group. This is this, this to get you thinking. Um, this was my group last year. Uh, they were called Open Source Laboratories or Fundamental, right? <laughs> Olaf, if you don't know that. If you don't have small kids, you don't know what I'm talking about in terms of that character. <laughs> but if you do have small kids, you know exactly what I'm talking about. All right, so they came up with this name, and it was really a great group of people, about 10 or 12 people in that group. And um, so that just tells you how folks can get together and be creative and come up with an interesting name, but actually relates to the engineering education modality they, they cared about. So again, you'll be doing some of this in the afternoon, so start thinking uh, as you go over there and looking at um, all, the po all the posters. So um, what will you have to do when you leave this place? So we want to get your feedback, so as you are going through the talks and listening to the sessions and so forth and speakers, please think about how you we think you could, we could improve the symposium. Just take good notes. 
Um, also get your hotel, hotel and travel squared away on the, on the return trip, get it back as quickly as possible to the NAE. Um, Beth's gonna send out an evaluation form, a survey form to get your feedback immediately after leaving um, this symposium, so you should get it within a week, and we hope you can turn it back really, really quickly. Um, and so um, all materials for the 2015 symposium will also be online, so you'll get copies of all the presentations. And then finally, to infinity and beyond. That's what this is all about. Okay, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Alton Roman. He is um, now the Executive De Director of the National Academy of Engineering. He was the former Vice President of Lockheed Martin Skunk Works, and so being an aerospace engineer, I have a great appreciation for him and what Lockheed has done over the years, and that's just a picture or a caricature of the numerous revolutionary aircraft that they have developed over their history, and Al had a large part to play in that. He also was at Sandia uh, National Laboratory for a few years, and um, now is heading up the NAE, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Alton Romig. Thank you, Daryl, and I'll uh, also add my congratulations to all of you who were selected to attend. I'll all add my thanks to, uh, to those of you that did the planning, et cetera, and making sure the execution works right. And in fact, I do both of those on behalf of myself, the Academy, and Dan Mote, our president. Dan right now is in London. Um, he was on the panel of judges that selected the Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering. And if you're unaware of what that is, it's sort of the Nobel Prize in Engineering that's given out every other year in the UK, and that happened to be coincident with this, or otherwise Dan would be here, here joining us. Um, you want to talk about the Skunk Works? We can do that sometime over a glass of wine. Who knows what I might say after I've had enough, but trust me, nothing I shouldn't. Um, but with that, let me, uh, let me turn it over and tell you a little bit about the National Academies and the National Academy of Engineering in particular, um, in case you're not familiar with it. Doesn't this make it advanced, Jason? There we go. Whoops. Come on. There we go. Well, first off, you should recognize that the National Academies, uh, as, as called just the National Academy of Sciences at the time, was formed in 1863 by Abraham Lincoln. Now, this is, a, this is a, sort of a, a 1920s Photoshop version. This setting never actually happened. This is a painting that was done of the key figures involved with the creation of the Academy in the 1860s that was painted in 1920 when we opened up the main building in Washington, D.C. But the letters in red really highlight what the Academy is all about, is to investigate, examine, and report upon any subject of science or art to the government. And what Lincoln's thought was at the time is that he, if he needed advice and he went to industry, he would get an answer biased by industry. If he went to the government, he would get an answer biased by government. At the time, universities in the U.S. were not great research institutions as they are today, so he never mentioned, mentioned academia, but I think certainly today the same would be true if you put academia into, into, that, uh, into that sort of context. And so his thought was, I will get volunteers who were the best scientists, engineers, and physicians in the country to volunteer their time to answer my questions. And I will reimburse you to, uh, to do the work for the studies. I'll buy your train tickets at the time, your airline tickets today. I'll feed you, but I'm not going to pay, pay you any compensation directly to advise me. That way, there's no bias. And that model has been the one that's persisted, persisted to this day. The academies get no baseline funding from the federal government. They're paid to, um, to do studies, and that's it. So the studies include your travel. It would include travel to events like this that has to be raised independently, sometimes by the government, sometimes not. We'll come back to this here in a second. But the advice is meant to be delivered um, to the government without the bias of compensation being involved for doing it. Well, as time went on, as you might guess, in fact, the very first study done in 1863 is about corrosion of iron ships. Sounds pretty engineering to me. The next study that was done is how do you make a magnetic compass work in an iron ship? Sounds like engineering to me again. And as you progress through the decades beyond that, by the time we got to into the, into the age of, of the space race and so forth, engineering was becoming more and more dominant, industry was becoming more and more important. There was a decision made in 1964 to split the National Academies into a Sciences Academy and an Engineering Academy. And in fact, that happened. They both exist underneath the same charter. So legally, we're all part of the NAS, but there's kind of a big capital NAS, and there's a lower level, level NAS. There's a three academies, because in 1970, the same thing happened with medicine, right? So now we have a National Academy of Sciences, a National Academy of Medicine, a National Academy of Engineering. They're all basically all three equals in the pot, although quite frankly, because there's also this capital NAS, if you will, it's the greatest among the three equals in terms of our governance. 
but each one of the academies is autonomous. We share methodologies, we share finance, financial structures and so forth, but they operate independently. We each have our own president, our own executive officer, and so forth. And that's the model that continues to, continues to this day. And in fact, by the time, you can see that here today, but by the time we got to World War I in 1916, um, where, where it was close to the U.S. entering the war, Woodrow Wilson wrote an executive order that created a standing body within the National Academy called the National Research Council. And so when many of you have been asked to perhaps serve on a study by the academies, it actually is executed through a body called the National Research Council. And so here you can see the way the National Research Council is constructed. All, the National Research Council actually reports to all three of the academies. Under our governance model, the chair of the National Research Council is the president of the NAS, and the president of NAE and the president of the Academy of Medicines are, are vice chairs of that council. Um, executive officers provide the support to make sure that that all functions properly. And across the bottom, you'll see our six divisions, one that looks at medicine, there's a long history between National Academy of Medicine, Institute of Medicine, et cetera, that we can talk about over coffee, but right now there's a medicine division, there's a transportation division, a behavioral and social sciences division, a policy and global affairs division, a earth and life sciences, and engineering and physical sciences. There's also each one of the academies, in particular medicine and engineering, also have their own self-contained division-like structure that will do studies that are focused on interests that are just to that academy. So for example, if we have a program inside of the NAE that is entirely focused on engineering, like one on engineering education, or a program like this one, this belongs to the NAE, not to the larger NRC, but the way that it's governed is exactly the same. In total, there's about 1,000 employees that are the staff that support all of you when you volunteer to spend time at workshops doing studies and so forth. Um, just out of a bit of personal history, I was first involved in a study, uh, I was at Sandia at the time in 1987 or so, and I've been involved with studies on and off from 1987 um, through to the, through to, well actually right now, once I moved to this position a few months ago, I'm now not officially allowed to be involved in studies because it would be considered a conflict of interest because I'm inside of the NAE. I still review reports, et cetera, unofficially, especially ones that involve military sorts of affairs. Nevertheless, that's what the academy construct looks like. Right? If you look at how the academy is put together, um, unlike the National Academy of Sciences, um, the National Academy of Engineering is, is intended to be about 50% from industry. One of the things that happened to the NAS between 1860 and 1960 is that its representation from industry fell from you know, some quarter of its membership or thereabouts to virtually zero. Today, something only of the order of a few tenths of a percent of the National Academy of Sciences membership is from industry. Right? And the government said, we want to have an industrial perspective in the advice that we give. And so that was one of the other driving forces for the creation of the National Academy of Engineering. So our goal, we're a little bit short of that right now. We're around 38% or so industry right now. But the goal is about 50% business, about 40% academic, and 10% from the government, meaning national labs, so Naval Research Lab, and NASA, and, and things like that. Um, but that gives us the mix. And I think you all know the statistics. That's actually quite reasonable. If you consider that about 90% or so, or 95% of engineering graduates um, end up in industry, and I think even at the PhD level, something like 70% end up in industry. So that's not an unreasonable split between the various sectors. Here are some of the things that are the programs per se that happen within the NAE. This is one of the first that is actually started um, almost actually 20 years ago in 1995 called the Frontiers of Engineering. It really is the precursor to the creation of the FOEE. In fact, I was in the first class in 1995 when I, my hair was uh, not platinum blonde, it was uh, sort of sandy blonde at the time. I think, Darla, you were the class of 96. Your hair was probably the same color, unless it's in a bottle and you're faking it. But, uh, <laughs> but Darrell was in the class of 96. It's happened every year since that time. And it's very much like this program, except it's not focused on the educational component. And if you look at the attendance of this, anybody here ever been in, a, in the, one of the FOEs? I'm sure we've got several, right? So that's a blend of people between academics, government, and industry that particip participate in that one. Really been quite successful. One of the things that we've done recently that's kind of fun with this one is we don't always do them here at Irvine. We'll occasionally find an industrial sponsor and do it on a site. So the FOE next year will be at Halliburton some focus on the, on the uh, oil industry and, and the, the chemical industry. And the one in 2017 will be at Pratt & Whitney. Um, as I'm working my way through my aerospace Rolodex as I, as I plan some of these things. But Pratt & Whitney will host one in 2017. 
right? The one that came after that now, as, as Daryl said, in year seven, is the frontiers of engineering education, which really can draw its roots back. This is a, this is a growth that came out of the FOE. If we look at some of the other things that we do, there's lots of publications that happen. Um, the Bridge is, is, a, is a journal that we do that, in fact, uh, goes out to every member of the academy. You can also get other copies. I think it's available online, for example, if you want to look at it. But they tend to have focuses. It might be on uh, you know, mitigating, mitigating the, uh, or accommodating the effects of, of, of climate change, or it might be, I'm supposed to pull, put one together on aerospace, for example, I think I'll probably, I didn't tell him yet this, but I'm going to ask Daryl to help me do that, you know, but we'll put one together on aerospace. There's some fun things that are in this journal. So, for example, one of the things we just recently started is an interview with somebody who's an engineer by training, but who actually has not worked in engineering, at least not for a major part of their career. The first one that we did, if we have any football fans in here, and if you're any old enough football fans, was Charlie Johnson, who used to be the quarterback for the St. Louis Cardinals and then the Denver Broncos. Charlie Johnson is a PhD in chemical engineering. He got that while he was playing pro football, and he's just retired from the faculty at New Mexico State. Uh, in fact, the last time I ran into him, he was the chair of the chemical engineering department at New Mexico State, so he was one of the first interviews. We're trying, how many people here know who Dolph Lundgren is, the actor? Dolph's a chemical engineer, too. So we haven't got that one locked down yet, but we're going to try to do an interview with Dolph Lundgren as another engineer who went down a, a different path uh, other than, than engineering. So a very, lots of communications that go out to members and to the public in general. The notion of public awareness of engineering is a very, very important issue to us. We also uh, began a program two years ago called the Engineering for You Video Contest. It's sort of a crowdsourcing effort that looks at middle school kids, high school kids, college kids, undergraduates, and then a wide open competition. And what it does is say, give us a short video that's on something related to engineering. The focus this past year was on one of the 14 grand challenges of engineering. I think you probably all know what the grand challenges of engineering are. If you don't, you, uh, we can talk about that later. I don't really have time to do it now but you can look it up in the web. If you look up Grand Challenges of Engineering, it'll pop up in the website. But these are the things that we think are the challenges that will drive that society needs to solve this century. Things like providing clean water, securing cyberspace, um, containing the car car managing carbon, for example. So there's 14 of these things. And we asked the kids to go out and put a video together that fit one of these. We had almost 300 videos that were submitted in total for between all the categories. And we're going to show you the grand prize winner. So let's take a look at the, uh, at the winner from this year. It's a two-minute video. In the real e old school on the far side of town, one class of students couldn't help it but frown. The teacher was teaching, but kids started snoring. For as one boy complained, This is terribly boring. Suddenly, poof, a lady appeared. A lady named Katie who looked kind of weird. Greetings, said Katie. Please have no fear. I'm here to help. I'm an engineer. I've come here today to bring you a tool, a tool that makes learning in school very cool. The Personalized Teacher, or PT for short. It comes with a headset and a USB port. So put on your thinking caps, get ready to explore. This new way of learning will not be a bore. Learning with PT is easy and fun. And it's not just for kids, but for everyone. It keeps track of your progress and knows how you learn best. Just be ready to learn and PT does the rest. Its interactive material helps improve understanding, so learning hard concepts won't be so demanding. And PT helps teachers see just what you need, so now they can do more to help you succeed. The students were amazed by this dazzling show, but there were still things that they wanted to know. Where did PT come from? Who made this cool gear? And what was that strange word she said? Engineer. Engineers, explained Katie, are women and men who solve the world's problems time and again. But we still can't solve everything, and that's why we're here, to show you that you too can become engineers. We designed PT to help you learn and grow, and apply in the world the new knowledge you know. But there's only so much that PT can do. The world needs your help. We're counting on you. The students were quiet, but they all understood. They must use what they learn and use it for good. So with the help of PT, they learned in their own way. They could make the world better, starting today. That, as I recall, was, a, was a, entered by, a, by an undergraduate group, I think maybe at the University of Texas. But uh, um, anyway, it gives you a sense of, of, of what that's about. So let's go back to the charts. 
Okay. All right. A couple of the other things that we have that are really quite exciting. Uh, engineer Girl, uh, Link Engineering in the Online Ethics Center. Um, ethics is relatively self-explanatory. You could look at that site yourself if you're concerned. Obviously, engineering and ethics is uh, every now and then something happens in the news that spikes up interest. The latent VW fiasco has sort of spiked up some interest in that again. So as you, I think we all know. But two up there that I think are very good, um, really aimed at, at STEM education before they get to college. Engineer Girl, if you've got a, a, a daughter or granddaughter, a niece, a goddaughter, that's sort of middle school age and maybe interested in engineering, you ought to tell them to go take a look at this site. Uh, what it is is a place where young girls, middle-aged school, can go and look at what it's like to be an engineer and they can ask questions. Like, what's it like to be an aerospace engineer at a university? And what this handler would do is send it to Nadine and let Nadine answer that question so that uh, people get direct answers from people that actually do what's relevant to the question that they ask. Link Engineering is one that's intended to provide tools for high school teachers who have now been asked to teach engineering. More and more schools are now using engineering, having engineering curricula at the high school level. And a lot of times they'll grab somebody who used to teach physics and say, go teach engineering. They don't know where to start. Well, this is really a toolbox to help them get the tools they need to begin to start to talk about engineering at the high school level. And that's so very, very exciting. So finally, I did mention the grand challenges of engineering before. Um, you can take a look at those. You can download this book off of, off of the web. But it really, we found it to be a great motivator. Uh, we started something called the Grand Challenges, of en uh, grand challenges Scholars Program, for which 120 schools have signed up so far. There are about a couple of dozen formal programs already in place. But the idea is to generate students that are called Grand Challenge Scholars, that in addition to the degree that they get in whatever their engineering discipline is, that they do some special things, like an international assignment, probably in the developing world, to broadly develop their skills at solving the kinds of problems that are captured and embodied in the global Grand Challenges. So, uh, you know, I'm sure many of your schools actually are amongst those that are in there, but if you're not, wonder if your school's involved. You can also, we can look it up for you, but you can also go to the National Academy website and look up Grand Challenges Scholars Program and you will see that come up.